Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Becky Sienke, and I served as Director of Behavioral Health and Special Projects at the Michigan Health Endowment Fund, and I have the pleasure of serving as your moderator this morning. I want to thank you for attending this webinar and for your interest in this recent report and presentation on telehealth in Michigan. I also wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the Ethel and James Flynn Foundation, who have served as our co-funder in this project and partners throughout the, the project and work. I also wanted to share with all of you that the webinar will be recorded today. I encourage you to include chats in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation or as they come up. We'll be breaking at various points throughout the presentation to address any questions you have, and we'll also save time at the end to answer any additional questions that arise. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Neil Hajra, the CEO of the Michigan Health Endowment Fund. Uh, thanks a lot, Becky. Um, let me start by thanking Becky back. Uh, Becky Sankey and also our colleague Phil Lewis really drove this work on the Health Fund side, so I'm very grateful for their lead roles in this. I also want to echo uh, the thanks to the Ethel and James Flynn Foundation. Andrew and Cole, uh, Andrea Cole and team are awesome, and uh, we're really excited we partnered with them in co-funding this work. And finally, thanks to the University of Michigan and its Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation for their work in creating the report. So um, let me tell you a little bit of background about why the Flynn Foundation and we came together to fund this particular report. We were looking for a few key things to focus on on telehealth. The first was to identify gaps in availability and use of telehealth, an ongoing area of interest for all of us. The second was to understand better the post-pandemic staying power or lack thereof of telehealth. And the third area is we wanted to deepen our collective understanding on why telehealth isn't reaching certain populations in the way it should, and probably more broadly, uh, what are the root causes affecting telehealth access. So um, if you're on this webinar, you're not going to be surprised that one of the findings of the report is that telehealth has an important ongoing role in improving access and equity in healthcare. So we all know that we didn't need the report to tell us that. However, we believe strongly that the report will give us all insight and tools to enhance and optimize our individual engagement through telehealth, as well as our collective adoption and promulgation of telehealth all with an eye towards improving health outcomes for Michiganders. Um, so to that end, let me illustrate just a few ways that the Michigan Health Endowment Fund is leveraging the report findings to guide some of our upcoming focus areas around telehealth. So the first area is that we're gonna keep emphasizing ease of use for everyone and meeting people where they are. Um, any of you who've worked with, um, you know, a, a treasured elder on using Zoom knows that even Zoom may not be as simple as we think for certain folks without experience. So we need to keep things simple and we need to understand um, the role of usability in uh, utilization of telehealth and also satisfaction uh, in using telehealth on the patient client side. Second area we're focusing on is eliminating disparities in utilization of telehealth. Uh, that could be a focus on technology proficiency uh, for some populations or areas of the state, or moving upstream, it could be uh, examining more closely things like broadband access, a place where the health fund hasn't traditionally been heavily involved, but we're starting to realize that in promulgating and enhancing and optimizing telehealth, we have to start asking those questions as well. What parts of the state lack the broadband access to make really effective use of telehealth? And finally, we are deepening our focus on training in telehealth and kind of in two ways. Um, first of all, we really need to remove uh, barriers for current providers to deploy telehealth. Um, and also, we want to contribute to developing medical curriculum um, for medical students so that telehealth becomes part and parcel in how they think about healthcare delivery from the time they're training to become doctors, nurses, and other healthcare uh, providers. And of course, we'll focus on other opportunities as the, as the landscape evolves and as we partner with many of you on this webinar on advancing telehealth in Michigan. So we're hoping that this conversation today and that this report will become a foundation for long-term impact in enhancing telehealth utilization and ultimately health outcomes. 
Um, and we really are grateful that all of you on the webinar are, webinar are here to learn and also act alongside us. So in the vein of continued learning, um, I'm really pleased to introduce and next let's hear from Dr. Chad Illimoodle. Uh, he is the medical director for virtual care at the University of Michigan Medical Group and assistant professor of urology. Thank you so much, Dr. Illimoodle, and take it away. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Neil. I really appreciate the introduction, and I really appreciate the honor to be here in front of this crowd um, to talk about this work that we've worked uh, that we've um, done for the last uh, year and a half, uh, exploring the landscape of telehealth uh, in the state of Michigan. And uh, just to provide you with a deeper understanding of my background, I'm so I'm an assistant professor at the University of Michigan and a health services researcher. And my primary focus revolves around investigating the effects of telehealth. Um, at a high level, on a policy level, on cost, access, and quality of care. And so for this purpose, I predominantly specialize in using um, insurance claims data to find if, to evaluate these high-level findings. Um, additionally, as Neil mentioned, I hold the position of medical director of virtual care for the University of Michigan Medical Group. And in this role, I contribute to the strategic development of new virtual care programs and the operational management of our 350,000 um, uh, virtual encounters that we have per year. So really an honor to be here uh, to contribute to this. And it was an honor to be approached by the Michigan Health Endowment Fund and the Ethel and James Flynn Foundation to collaborate on this report. I'm really happy with this, how it turned out and happy to share the findings with you. The whole point of the report is to um, evaluate the landscape of telehealth utilization in Michigan, as Neil mentioned, to identify gaps so that we can move towards improving those gaps and in, in examining the landscape in the context of very specific state and national policy considerations uh, was also an important um, aim of this report. Um, I will say that the whole report is available on the Michigan Health Endowment page. Uh, the URL, the shortened version of the URL is listed up there. Um, you have the option to download the whole report or specific sections that you may be interested in. And uh, today's webinar, I'm going to walk you through the key findings in the report covering various aspects such as telehealth trends, uh, the impact of telehealth expansion in rural areas, the role of licensure waivers on telehealth, and the effects of telehealth expansion on improving access and behavioral health um, services. And so some of these were uh, uh, analyses that were catered specifically for uh, for the report. Some we also did on a national scale too. So I'll highlight some of the national findings as well. And I, I really do encourage you, there's going to be a lot of data shown and I uh, want to encourage you to, uh, uh, to contribute questions through the Q&A. Um, Becky will help moderate those questions so that uh, we could uh, dig in deeper with any of these particular findings. Um, so to kick off, uh, we're going to start talking about telehealth use trends among Medicare, Medicaid, and uh, commercially insured um, individuals. So as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic led to a significant rise in telehealth usage due to social distancing and regulatory changes. Before the pandemic, only a small portion of healthcare providers, less than 1% of healthcare providers, less than 1% of patients used billable telehealth services. In March and April of 2020, as most states enforced shut down executive orders, telehealth usage saw a remarkable rise. And that takes us to our first analysis, which is showing um, telehealth utilization among Medicare patients um, during the, um, during the, prior to the pandemic and then um, a couple of years out. There's three lines that I wanna highlight, um, I'll bring your, to your attention. The black line there represents total care. So what you're seeing here is the total number of monthly outpatient visits. The yellow line represents those visits that were done in person, and then the blue line represents telehealth. So our analysis shows that telehealth utilization among Medicare patients greatly increased during the early months of the pandemic, and it peaked at about 65% in our state um, in April of 2020. But later, telehealth usage, of course, declined as in-person care became safer and as individuals started to come back in person. And we're at around 11% of outpatient being, visits being conducted through telehealth by the end of 2022. Similar trends were observed in the commercially insured population. Telehealth use surged during the early parts of the pandemic, March through uh, May 2020, 
Uh, and that at that time, it was comprising about 60% of outpatient visits in April. And then the telehealth usage declined over time, just like we saw in the Medicare population. It is worth noting, though, the percentage of commercially insured individuals using telehealth remained higher and still remains higher than Michigan's Medicare population. It's also important to note um, in this slide and on the slide before, the black line, which is the overall volume of care, remained relatively steady compared to pre-pandemic levels. This is suggesting that telehealth mostly replaced in-person care or serves as a substitute for in-person care. With our partners over at CHEER, we did an analysis using Medicaid data as well. And so uh, Medicaid, Michigan Medicaid followed, uh, beneficiaries followed a very similar trend. Uh, what you're seeing here is just the percent line. Telehealth accounted for 35% of outpatient visits among Michigan Medicaid patients at its peak in April and May of 2020. And then uh, as with the other payers, we saw a gradual decline to about 12 to 13% by the end of um, 2021. And then um, specifically looking at Medicaid uh, beneficiaries, uh, less than 1% of Medicaid beneficiaries were using telehealth prior to February of 2020. It peaked at 63% in April of 2020. And then um, over time, this number gradually decreased. And by December of 2021, 23% uh, of Medicaid enrollees who had an outpatient visit that month had that visit through telehealth. So the key takeaways on the trends, um, during the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a significant surge in telehealth usage among Medicare, Medicaid, and commercially insured patients. However, since then, the proportion of telehealth visits has gradually declined and currently stands at about 11%, 13%, and 17% of all outpatient visits for Medicare, Medicaid, and commercially insured uh, patients, respectively. It's notable that for all three populations, the overall volume of outpatient visits remained steady, comparable to pre-pandemic levels, indicating that telehealth predominantly substituted for in-person care. So the policy considerations that I take away from these analyses is that telehealth continues to play a crucial role in providing healthcare services to patients in Michigan, and the concern about telehealth being overused can at least somewhat be alleviated by evidence that the overall volume of outpatient visits has uh, remained stable. So I'll, um, that, I'll go on to the next section, uh, which is on telehealth expansion in rural and non-rural Michigan counties. And then Becky, if there's any questions that are coming through the q and uh, you're more than happy to uh, interrupt me and I could go into those questions. So rural counties often grapple with issues like population density, geographical isolation and limited healthcare resources. Providing healthcare in these regions can be challenging due to healthcare shortages uh, funding and also uh, access to specialized care. The Office of Federal, the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy designates 553 out of the 979 zip codes in Michigan as rural. In 2020, about 28% of M Michigan Medicare beneficiaries lived in these uh, areas that you see here on the map. Telehealth was originally covered about 20 years ago, and its main intention was improving access to rural care. And so while it was very well intended and it's been covered for over 20 years, its utilization was hindered primarily due to this concept of the originating site requirement. And to put it very simply, the originating site requirement means that you can't connect from home even if you live in a rural area, but instead you have to travel to a health professional shortage area and to a physician's office or a medical facility in order to connect. And that was what was in place for the Medicare program um, up until the early part of the pandemic. As you can imagine, the logistics around this uh, kept many healthcare providers really from investing in it and even offering it to, for more patients. So during the pandemic, Medicare, Medicaid, and other payers uh, expanded the list of originating sites and also included the patient's home. So whether you're rural or whether you uh, live in a rural area or in a urban area, you were able to connect from home. So to understand the effect of including the patient's home as an originating site on telehealth adoption, particularly in rural areas, we analyzed telehealth visit patterns in 2019, 2020, and 2021. And that's, those are the three maps that you see here. In 2019, the telehealth services were primarily provided to residents in rural counties as expected. There were some exceptions in some urban counties, but for the most part it was in rural counties and in the map that represents the darker areas uh, where there was higher density of telehealth being provided. But it's also important to look at the legend telehealth encounters per thousand beneficiaries. 
um, to really understand the quantity of services that we're providing. So bottom line in 2019, it was primarily in rural areas, but overall it was very low. In 2020 and also in 2021, there was a higher concentration. There was a shift of telehealth services to air, urban areas. This is even after adjusting for population density in these counties. Notably, the number of telehealth visits per thousand Medicare beneficiaries, even in rural areas, if you look at these legends here in 2020 and 2021, even in rural areas were five to 10 times higher than they were um, in 2019 when patients were not allowed to connect from home. So although telehealth usage in rural areas decreased in 2021 compared to 2020, if you look at the legend, um, it still remained significantly higher than the 2019 levels. So when accounting for population size um, in 2019, that's the, the list of counties on the left. The list of counties on the left were the counties that really received the highest number of telehealth visits uh, per thousand beneficiaries that lived in that area. So population adjusted, these were the counties that had the most. In 2020, there was a noticeable uptick in telehealth utilization among urban counties. And so even after adjusting for population size, uh, residents in Macomb, Washtenaw, and uh, Wayne counties had the highest telehealth service usage. So the key takeaways from this particular analysis is that although telehealth policies like the originating site were initially established to promote telehealth adoption in rural areas, the relaxation of these geographic, uh, geographic specific policies actually allowed telehealth to grow in both urban and in both rural settings. Um, so the policy consideration here is permanently expanding the list of originating sites to include the patient's home can increase adoption in rural areas, which is what we see here in the data, and then also limiting services just to rural regions would significantly impact its use outside of these regions, but also will impact its use within these regions as well. So I want to pause for a second and see if... Um, Becky, are there any, any questions? I think, I think you're able to keep going and um, we're getting clarification on a few things, but I think it's like keep moving along and we'll keep taking questions. We'll okay. Continue so, to add them to the Q&A. Perfect. Perfect. Um, no problem at all. Keep it going. Um, and so next thing we're going to talk about is the relationship between telehealth utilization and broadband access in Michigan, which is also a very important um, uh, topic for the Michigan Health Endowment Fund. So broadband access. Um, the Broadband access is important for telehealth. Effective telehealth relies on fast, dependent internet, internet connection, and this is what is commonly referred to as broadband. Inadequate broadband access can hinder patients in rural and in remote areas from connecting to healthcare providers, but also it can hinder healthcare providers' ability to, perform, to offer telehealth services if their practices are located in these areas. So to evaluate broadband access in Michigan, we used um, data from the 2021 American Community Survey. This American Community Survey is publicly available. Uh, it's administered by the United States Census Bureau, and it provides insight into social, economic, and housing aspects, including um, specifically that question we were looking at, which is household internet subscriptions for broadband. So our analysis showed that 86% of Michigan households um, as a state had access to internet broadband. Uh, on a statewide scale, that puts us in puts us as 28th in terms of households with broadband. At the county level, broadband subscription rates ranged anywhere between 72% and 92%, and that distribution across the state is what you see on this map here. Uh, we studied the correlation between broadband access and telehealth visits. So we investigated specifically the link between the percentage of households with broadband access in a county, so that's what you see on the x-axis there, and the number of telehealth visits per thousand beneficiaries in 2020. Uh, so as anticipated, the analysis revealed a positive correlation. The correlation coefficient was 0 0.60 between these two factors. Further, um, just to give it additional insight um, on this particular issue, we categorized um, counties into two groups based on whether they were above or below the state median for both broadband access and for telehealth use. And so um, this is the list of counties that were below the state, state median for telehealth visits and also below the state median for percentage of households with broadband internet subscription. So this highlights Michigan counties that are falling behind uh, median for both broadband access and their associated telehealth also represents areas that um, for um, targeted policies to improve broadband access. 
The key takeaways here are that the percentage of households with broadband internet subscription uh, in Michigan counties ranges from 72% to 92%. And then there was a positive correlation between broadband access and higher utilization of telehealth services. Of course, there could be other factors beyond broadband that's affecting the telehealth utilization rates in those particular counties that were listed, but um, certainly it looks like a, a, pos a positive factor here. Um, and policy considerations, targeted policies designed to increase broadband internet access in counties with low percentage of households uh, subscribing to broadband, like the ones that were listed on the slide before, which are also available in our report, could potentially improve telehealth utilization in those particular areas. Um, so I'll go on to the next section uh, of the report, which was related to the demographic uh, characteristics of telehealth users and telehealth non-users. So uh, we conducted a statewide analysis, but also a national analysis comparing demographic characteristics of Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries who utilize telehealth and those who did not. So the utilizers were called telehealth users. Uh, which is what you see on the first column there. And then the telehealth non-users is what you see on the second column. So the results of this analysis revealed several insights. Um, first, across age groups, which is the bracket that you see here, um, there was a relatively equal distribution among telehealth users and telehealth non-users, meaning that the dem demographic spread um, among both of these groups was similar. There were some exceptions like the under 65 population where 21.9% of this population um, of telehealth users were under 65 compared to 17% of non-users who were under 65 um, uh, for, for the non-users. Uh, moving to gender specific, more females utilize telehealth services compared to males. This is aligned with the fact that females tend to pursue more healthcare services than male. We looked at racial differences. Uh, we really found minimal disparities in race ethnicity uh, in the way that we did this analysis between telehealth users and non-users. Um, individuals residing in rural zip codes had lower telehealth usage compared to those in non-rural areas and patients that were dual eligible uh, for Medicaid, means, which, which is often used as an indicator for low income, um, actually had a higher rate of telehealth usage. Uh, notably, as I mentioned before, telehealth usage trends that you see here among Michigan beneficiaries aligned with those that were seen um, at the national level too. So we did want to look at this over time and to see how have, how have the demographic trends evolved over time um, for telehealth users. So this is specifically looking at that population of telehealth users. And this graph that you see here are telehealth user proportions by age prior to 2019, it was actually largely focused on the less than 65 population. Um, and then in 20 and 2021, 20, we see that it's more equally distributed um, and more reflective of the general healthcare user. Among females, higher usage was seen in 2020 and 21 compared to 2019. And then for race, uh, we found that there was a stronger concentration among whites using telehealth prior to 20 or prior to 2020 so in 2019 but in 2020 and in 2021 the distribution uh, was more reflective of the general healthcare population and then again as for rural as expected in 2019 it was mostly most telehealth usage was in rural areas and then in 2021 um, less so as it expanded into urban areas so the key takeaways on, on the demographic characteristics of users and non-users um, is that telehealth usage was more prevalent among beneficiaries who were under 65, female, dual eligible for Medicaid, and resided in non-rural areas. And so in the big, I think the big policy consideration here is that although there were slight variations in telehealth usage among different demographics, it's crucial to acknowledge that all of these groups actually had much, much higher use of telehealth. Uh, after 2020 than it was in 2019. And we're not seeing a big spread in, um, in disparities among these groups here, uh, at least for utilization of telehealth, the way that we measured it. It was used across all age groups, genders, races, ethnicities, rural, urban location, and income levels. Now, there's a big caveat here because this is an analysis that's being done in Medicare claims, um, which does limit our ability to look at telehealth modalities, which is very important. And so while we didn't look deeper at this in, um, in the particular report, our previous research 
has broken this down using electronic medical record data for to video visits and phone use. And our previous research actually suggests that discontinuation of insurance coverage for phone visits, for example, taking away phone visits may actually reduce telehealth access for patients who are older, African-American, need an interpreter, rely on Medicaid, and reside in areas with limited broadband access. And if anyone's interested in that particular study, it was published a few years ago, and the citation for that study, study is um, listed down below. I do have a couple of questions that I will send your way. And the sure. first is, has any of your work identified a negative impact to telehealth on rural clinics losing volume to bigger urban centers? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Um, so we did not look at um, in none of the work that we've done for this, although that is a really interesting um, uh, question, looked at shift of patients, uh, patients that are kind of now you have the idea here is that um, once you have access to telehealth, you can kind of see whichever provider in the state that you want. And does that negatively affect the volume at rural health clinics? I think that's a in very interesting hypothesis and question, uh, but we haven't explored that. Thank you. Um, we do have a couple of questions, which I, I think you've answered. Um, and the question, one of the questions is around the quality and reliability of broadband access and information about that and um, further questions about the link between telehealth and broadband access independent of internet access. Do you feel that there's further work to do with getting communities yeah. to utilize telemedicine? Yeah, I think, you know, the, you know, our, again, a lot of the report here is just sort of looking at the landscape. It's just sort of like the first initial questions. Even within the American Community Survey, there's a couple different ways that you could um, look at broadband access and and also you know having access to broadband. What does that word access mean? Um, if you can't afford it, you know that's still a problem. And then um, and so there's a lot of other factors that I think um, play into this. Uh, we looked at it at a very superficial level and you know sort of had an idea of where the problem sites or the um, lower usage sites are in the are in the state. Um, and uh, but I think it does require further exploration for sure. Great. Um, just want to make sure I'm grabbing the, the others that um, I think are really important right now. There were several questions about the um, whether or not um, phone or audio only was included in the um, original yeah. sections of the report. And I think that you've answered that question and that they were, but you haven't divided the two apart, right? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, they were, so phone visits at telehealth. So one of the biggest challenges with identifying and separating phone and um, video visits and claims data is that, um, that particularly in the years that we were looking at the earlier years, there were some types of visits that could have been done through video or through audio. And so on when we look in claims, you can't actually distinguish between the two. Yes, there are phone visit codes, but then there were also visit codes that could have been done either through video or audio. So it's not very reliable in claims. That's why we did that other study using electronic medical record um, data to sort of look at that. But I think that's a very important topic, uh, distinguishing between the modalities of telehealth. So I think Becky, in the interest of time, I'll keep going and then uh, we can circle, circle back to these some of these questions. They're great questions, I love it. And I think we can continue to talk about this at the end of the presentation. So I do wanna go on to the next topic, which is the influence of licensure waivers on telehealth services that are provided um, across state lines. And before digging into this topic, I just wanna start with a little bit of background on what this is and the importance of why we put this in the report. So interstate telehealth or interstate healthcare refers to patients that are receiving medical care from clinicians that are um, located in different states. So clinicians located in a different state and the resident could be um, in, in the state of Michigan. Prior to the public health emergency, state, state medical licensure regulations limited telehealth practices to practice to patients that were within the clinician's licensed state. So taking, you know, kind of flipping that to, uh, if I was licensed in the state of Michigan to practice medicine, I can only provide care to patients that are physically located in Michigan, even if they live in Michigan, but they're taking a vacation in Oklahoma or in um, Vermont. And so, but during the public health emergency, there were temporary measures, a lot of executive orders, all 50 states and, and DC passed some form of order or some sort of measure that allowed 
temporary, temporarily allowed interstate healthcare to occur. So, but that all reversed as each one individual state's executive orders were expiring. So as of December, 2022, 42 states in DC have had ended their declarations. Interstate health telehealth is no longer allowed um, unless of course you have a license in that particular state but for the most part across the country. Uh, despite policymakers interest in this topic, there is a lot of interest in this topic even at the state um, Michigan state legislator, legislative level as well too. There is really a lack of data on interstate telehealth and how it was used during this time of maximum flexibility. And that's why we did this study uh, to look at how telehealth was used within our state. And we also did a similar study at the national level too. So we used Medicare data to analyze quarterly patterns of four different visit types. The first visit type is in-state, in-person. And that's what you see on the blue bar here. The second visit type is in-state telehealth. That's the yellow bar. Out-of-state in-person, which is the green uh, bars that you see there. And then out-of-state telehealth, which is the smallest and the orange bar. Out-of-state here in this definition means that the patient is located in Michigan, but then the clinician is located in a different state. So our findings suggest that the, although the number of out-of-state telehealth services grew in 2020, so the number of services that were being delivered grew, the proportion of telehealth visits, of telehealth services across state lines remained fairly stable across the couple of years. In 2019, out-of-state out of telehealth visits constituted less than 1% of all office visits and 3% of all telehealth visits. In 2020, when there was maximum licensure relaxation, these visits still accounted for less than 1% of office visits and about 3% of telehealth visits. And these findings align with our national trends, which we published in Health Affairs. The citation for the national study is listed below and also a recent report by the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission. So our study also indicates that out-of-state care um, is less common in, in, in Michigan than um, compared to other states. This is what you see here in this figure. The yellow bar represents total out-of-state care, in-person care and uh, telehealth care. And then the blue line represents the proportion of that uh, total care that was through telehealth. So interstate telehealth is the blue line that you see there. Both of these lines are important. The highest percentage of office visits that are done by out-of-state clinicians are states like DC, Virginia, uh, West Virginia, and Vermont. And the states that had the highest rate of out-of-state telehealth included DC again, Vermont, and New Hampshire. Interestingly, in 26 states, less than 1% of office visits were conducted by out-of-state clinicians. Michigan ranks 37th in office visits by out-of-state clinicians and 45th in telehealth by out-of-state clinicians. Furthermore, analysis showed that 49% of out-of-state visits in 2020 were with clinicians from neighboring states like Illinois, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. And 89% of the out-of-state visits, which also includes in-person or telehealth, involved Michigan residents and clinicians from one of the top 10 um, states that are listed here. So our main takeaway is that in 2020, when medical licensure rules were fully relaxed uh, and permitted and out-of-state clinicians were permitted to conduct telehealth visits with Michigan residents, it's still, interstate telehealth still only constituted 0.47% of office visits and 3% of uh, telehealth visits in Michigan. 49% of out-of-state visits involved Michigan residents invo uh, receiving care from clinicians in neighboring states like Illinois, Indiana, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. And 28% of these states, uh, these out-of-state visits actually occurred between Michigan residents and clinicians pr practicing in Florida. Now, there is one big limitation to this is that, again, we're using claims for this analysis. So we don't know the physical location of the patient when they're actually conducting the visit. We're using the address that they're registered and then the clinician's address uh, where they're registered to see, to decide whether or not a interstate visit occurred. Um, so obviously there's, you know, could be more work and these numbers could be higher if you knew the actual physical location at the time. So the big policy consideration here from my standpoint is that overall utilization of interstate telehealth remains low for Michigan residents. And the most effective approach uh, to facilitating their access to out-of-state care would probably include uh, prioritizing medical license or reciprocity agreements with neighboring states, like uh, with neighboring states in Florida, where Michigan snowbirds um, may have established healthcare providers as sort of the most uh, efficient way of uh, providing the ability to do interstate care. 
Um, and so I'll, I'll keep going to the next section and then hopefully we can circle back with some of these questions um, at, the, at the last part of the, the webinar. So telehealth usage by federally qualified health centers and rural health clinics. Um, this is a short section, um, just by way of background for everyone, federally qualified health centers and rural health clinics offer essential healthcare services to underserved communities. They're absolutely important for our state. Uh, they're federally funded and must meet specific criteria, including the um, providing care regardless of the patient's ability to pay. Um, FQHCs, interestingly, and RHCs were initially limited to just as originating sites for telehealth, but with the CARES Act, um, changed this and allowed them to be distance site providers as well. Um, and the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2023 extended this provision till December 20, uh, till December 31st, 2024. Our analysis of the 2021 quarter four Medicare provider services file identified uh, 273 active FQHCs and 221 active RHCs in Michigan, which is what you see um, plotted here. We examined Medicare claims from uh, Michigan's FQHCs and RHCs to assess their telehealth usage. The exhibit that you see here includes the top 10 FQHCs along uh, in, in terms of volume of Medicare claims, um, along with their proportion of total visits that were done through telehealth. In 2020, the median telehealth visit percentage for the top 10 FQHCs by volume of Medicare claims was 13%. We did a similar analysis for RHCs and found that percentage to be about 9%. I think one extremely important limitation and caveat with this particular analysis is that it's important to consider that Medicare patients might only make up a small portion of the patient population at these, at these clinics. And that's the um, substrate we did to look at this analysis, but it is it does limit this particular analysis. Uh, but nevertheless, the top 10 um, FQHCs and RHCs identified by the highest volume of Medicare claims provided a median of 13 and 9% of their visits via telehealth in 2020, respectively. And um, in general, as we all know, telehealth is an important part of care delivery for FQHCs and RHCs in Michigan. So I'll move on to the, the last section of the report, uh, which has to do with the impact of telehealth on expansion uh, to behavioral health services. And this was kind of the sort of the, the meatiest part of the report. Um, I'll, I will spend a little bit more time explaining the methods here than I did in the other sections, which were more straightforward. Um, here we, um, this is actually a novel approach that we took to assessing access. And um, so I wanna sort of talk through uh, the, the methods that we used here. Um, and just by way of background, telehealth really has transformed the landscape of behavioral health by providing convenient access to mental health and, uh, and substance abuse treatment. It's just completely changed the field. Historically, obstacles like provider shortages and stigma have hindered access to behavioral health issues. That's still a problem, but telehealth does in some way address these issues by enabling uh, remote connections and uh, between patients and providers. Um, as we all know, the Centers of Disease Control uh, reveals that over half of individuals will experience mental illness or disorder in their lifetime. One in five Americans face a mental illness every year. In Michigan, nearly 20% of its 9.9 .9 million residents were estimated to have a mental illness in, in 2019. This is a very important topic for the Michigan Health Endowment Fund um, and very important topic for us to assess. So we did two analyses to understand the impact of telehealth and behavioral health and access to behavioral health. First, we assessed the effect of telehealth expansion on behavioral health access um, by defining, be, by examining the extent that the ex telehealth expansion changed access to care from behavioral health specialists in counties with high demand for behavioral health services. So this was our demand analysis. We're going to show our supply analysis next. But we defined demand using two different methods, demand for behavioral health services. Uh, method one is survey-based, uh, prevalence of any mental illness um, as defined in the 2018 through 2020 National Survey on Drug Use and Health. And then the second one, second way we defined demand was using claims, behavioral health diagnosis insurance claims from 2019 to 2021, specifically Medicare claims. Uh, we, these claims could have come from any provider, not just a behavioral health specialist, it could have come from a primary care provider as well. Uh, you needed to have at least two claims to have the diagnosis of behavioral health. So both methods of estimating demand have their advantages and disadvantages. For instance, survey-based methods might provide the 
overall need for behavioral health services, regardless of whether or not care was received, but it may also overestimate the demand for behavioral health services as patients may self-report symptoms without necessarily meeting criteria or even desiring criteria for treatment from a behavioral health specialist. On the other hand, claims-based methods are limited too. Claims-based methods may underestimate prevalence by not capturing individuals with behavioral health conditions who ended up never seeking any care or, or sought out-of-pocket care. Therefore, we use both survey and claims-based methods to, to provide a more comprehensive understanding of the county level demand for behavioral health services and how telehealth has changed that or has, has um, helped to serve those high demand areas. For counties with high demand, we assess telehealth utilization here in this chart uh, for Medicare using Medicare data. The yellow bar represents the proportion of behavioral health specialist visits that were conducted via telehealth. On average, 46% of behavioral health specialist visits in these high demand counties, which are the ones that are listed on the left hand side that were defined using survey methods, uh, were 46% of these visits were done via telehealth. And it ranged from 29% in Cass County to 60% in Wayne County. And then our second approach of looking at demand was using claims. And you can see when I flip over from the last slide to this slide, these, um, these counties change, and that's because um, you know, like I mentioned, one, one may overestimate, one may underestimate, so we're looking at this comprehensively. So when we did a similar analysis, we found that 53% of visits with behavioral health specialists in, these high, in the high demand counties as defined by claims uh, were done through telehealth, and this ranged from 43% to 63%. We did, our partners at CHEER also did a complementary analysis using Medicaid data um, in 2021, 17.5% um, of visits for mental health uh, disorders um, by Medicaid beneficiaries residing in high demand counties or through telehealth. And note that this is not a perfect apples to apples comparison with the Medicare analyses because the definition of behavioral health visit did differ between our two groups, between us and uh, our partner group chair when they performed this analysis. So <clears throat> the, um, the next analysis is our behavioral health shortage analysis. So we did the demand part now we're looking at the supply part by looking at shortage areas. So we specifically wanted to understand telehealth's impact and access to access to behavioral health in counties where there are behavioral health shortages. Michigan, according to HRSA, has 242 health professional shortage areas for mental health care. Um, there's many different ways to define a shortage area. So the way that we delineated shortage areas is that we identified counties with 10 or fewer behavioral health providers um, and, um, and of course, while there could be variations in how organizations define shortage areas, it's noteworthy that 86% of our shortage areas, the counties that we identified as shortage areas, also aligned with a pre previous report on behavioral health access that was put together through the Michigan Health Endowment Fund, partnering with Alterum. So we had about 86% agreement um, on these shortage areas. So first, for counties with behavioral health shortages, this was our first look at this data, uh, we looked at the proportion of visits that were conducted through telehealth and those shortage areas and further methods, of course, are available in the report. The shortage areas are listed here at the bottom and um, approximately 57% of the visits with behavioral health providers uh, were in these shortage areas were carried out via telehealth. So we wanted to take this a little bit further, and this is where our methods become a little bit more novel here, is that we, we want to take this one, one step further by digging into telehealth visits to see if they're really improving access to care in these shortage areas, or are they just providing more convenient care for residents in behavioral health shortage areas? So when, typically when we're looking at access, at least the way it's been published before, it's always act, related to telehealth, it's always just been utilization, but we wanted to take it one step further. And in order to do that, we set up this, um, this type of a study design. And so assume that County A is a behavioral health shortage area. So a patient that resides in County A, which is des designated as a behavioral health shortage area, has four options for care. The first two options at the top there represent a local care. So they could get in-person local care, or they can get in-county um, in, uh, telehealth care. And so that in-county telehealth care is really just more convenient care because that healthcare provider is located within the county. The bottom two areas or uh, care categories represent, um, uh, represent um, care outside of the county. And the first one is in-person. So driving outside of your county to get care. 
And then the second one, and this is the part that we were most interested in, this is what we defined as access, are behavioral health providers outside of the county providing care into that county. And that's where we were really interested. And so uh, we found some significant results here. Um, the figure illustrates um, a significant findings, substantial portion of patients that lived in behavioral health shortage areas received care through telehealth from providers in other counties. Um, and that's the yellow bar there. So the blue and green bar that you see here, the shortage areas are listed on the left here. The blue and green bar represents local care, whether it's in person or just more convenient telehealth care. And then the blue, and the dark blue and the yellow here represents out of county care. The dark blue represents out of county in-person care, so you're driving, and then the yellow bar represents telehealth care. So there was a significant, all these blue bars or yellow bars represent a significant amount of behavioral health specialists that were located outside of the county providing care into the shortage area. Specifically, we discovered that 82% of behavioral health visits in the shortage area were conducted from specialists from other counties, and 47% of that um, occurred through telehealth. So these findings strongly emphasize that telehealth has greatly increased access to behavioral health, behavioral health services in areas facing shortages by providing um, care from providers that are outside of these particular counties where the shortages exist. So the key takeaway here is using two methods. We found that uh, the, there's a high prevalence of mental, uh, mental behavioral health uh, diagnoses in the state of Michigan, approximately one in five individuals have a behavioral health, mental health condition. Um, this, there are shortage areas. In fact, 50% of our counties have 10 or fewer um, specialists and 20% have one or none. In 2021, 46% of all behavioral health care provided to Medicare beneficiaries residing in counties with high demand for these services occurred um, through telehealth. And then also in these high demand areas, uh, they among Medicaid beneficiaries, about 52% received treatment via telehealth. Um, and in, eight, in 2021, 82% of behavioral health care was delivered to Medicare patients living in areas with shortages. Um, and 47% of those visits, as I mentioned, um, were conducted via telehealth. So the big policy consideration or takeaway from this analysis is that telehealth expansion has undeniably enhanced access to behavioral health services in two significant ways. Number one, it was provided means of delivering care to in, in Michigan with high demand for, in, in counties with high demand for behavioral health services. And second, it extended access to counties where there were shortages of behavioral health providers, bringing this much needed service um, into these underserved communities. Just wanna take a quick second before we get into some of the questions to acknowledge our statistical team that helped with this. Um, again, the partnership that we had with the Michigan Health Endowment Fund, Ethel and James Flynn Foundation, and also our own university, um, which provided the funding for this report. And then um, Medicaid, I just wanna get, acknowledge Sarah Clark from the, Medi uh, from the CHEER program that helped with the Medicaid analysis, and then also our data access through the Michigan Value Collaborative. Uh, we're not going to be able to get to every question, but I think that if there are questions that are still outstanding, you can feel free to contact me. Thank you very much for to you and your team, Ted, for an incredible report. So much information that you've sifted through in a short period of time. I hope people will take the opportunity to review the full report for more information. But if we have a few minutes, I'd like to ask you a few questions that are outstanding. Sure. And one of those questions is, do you have data that would differentiate between on-demand patient-initiated or practice-initiated telehealth visits? So um, I'm, I'm assuming that the person asking the question is referring to on-demand. And so on-demand um, could be defined a few different ways, but I think the typical way people think of on-demand is through large sort of uh, for-profit organizations like um, American Well, Teladoc, um, Many of these organizations have partnered with insurance companies and do provide on-demand services. Um, I, I actually don't have any particular data on utilization or how that's impacted access to care. Um, um, and, but I do think it's a really important way that uh, healthcare provider or healthcare or how patients nowadays uh, do uh, end up getting their care. And so, um, but I don't have a way to differentiate that in claims. Um, and, um, but you know, if there, if there are ideas out there, it would be an important area to study. Thank you. 
Another question is, do you know anything about, do we know anything, excuse me, about Michigan residents living out of state accessing Michigan providers via telehealth? So um, individuals that are living out of state um, that are accessing um, telehealth. Um, so probably not a lot of good insight into that. This particular analysis that we did was focused on Michigan re people that have registered their address with the Medicare program in the state of Michigan. So if they are living out of state, um, but, um, you know, but they're address is registered in the state of Michigan, we would capture them as a Michigan resident. And so we wouldn't necessarily have insight into that second address. Um, so that is uh, less available, uh, you know, from our from our line of sight, we could look at uh, patients that were that were other patients like uh, patients in Ohio, and so forth that are getting care from Michigan physicians and, clini and other clinicians and APPs, we could look at that, um, just kind of doing the reverse of what we did, but that we don't, we haven't done that. So I don't have insight into that. You shared information about telehealth being used across all demographics. There was a specific question about accessibility for poor and low income populations and whether or not you've explored data specific to those populations. Yeah, we, we have explored data uh, for those populations, uh, not so much in this report. In this report, we explored those populations, but because we lumped all telehealth modalities together, there's, a, you know, it's, that's a limitation, uh, and that's kind of the limitation that occurs with claims, um, but the, um, you know, that, that paper that I did cite um, looked at low-income populations, and particularly we looked at zip codes where um, uh, residents uh, with zip codes that were um, identified as low income, and we did see a disparity there, uh, particularly in the a disparity in the use of phone versus uh, video visits. Thank you. Another question is, have you considered including in your studies those with disabilities, specifically those that are deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing? Yeah, I think a very, very important population, um, particularly if, you know, the telehealth modality like video visits doesn't have the capability to, um, you know, to accommodate for those particular populations. I think it's an important population to look at. Uh, with claims, we may be, uh, may be limited to, you know, yes, no disability, uh, especially if, if the disability was the criteria for having access to Medicare. Uh, but I haven't personally looked at that any further, but I do think it's a very important topic. And another question, what specialty care services have the highest demand in rural Michigan? Any particular areas in Michigan? Oh, specialty services? Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. Uh, we did not explore specialty services. We kept it focused on, um, on uh, behavioral health. And behavioral health was a, um, you know, it, it, it certainly there was a high demand. And that's been shown um, not just in this report based on surveys, based on claims, but in many, many other reports. I do want to highlight the uh, report by um, the partnership between Michigan Health Endowment Fund and Alterum, a recently, re uh, report, recently released report on behavioral health access in the state, uh, which was great. And, um, and so, but beyond behavioral health, we didn't look any further to other specialists. Um, I think that's a very important topic. Um, and the, that analysis actually could be done in a similar fashion where you identify behavioral health, I'm uh, sorry, um, specialist shortage areas, looking at the number of providers in each county, and then look to see um, how patients in that county are receiving specialist care and whether it's coming through telehealth into the county, just like we did for behavioral health uh, specialists. Thank you. And we have one other question about awareness of um, telehealth utilization for home hospitalization. I, um, whether or not you're familiar with utilization and scenarios where there might be a home hospitalization. Home hospitalization. Okay. So this is uh, referring to this concept of, I think it's referring to this concept of hospital at home, which mm -hmm. is um, a newer concept that uh, really kind of started to get uh, traction with the COVID-19 pandemic, where uh, when patients are admitted to the hospital, they can be discharged early and continue care at home, or instead of being admitted to a hospital, they can actually have care at home, which is a very, it's a growing area. Um, and virtual is obviously a big portion of this. There are home visits that are done by nurses and community paramedics, depending on the organization that is helping with that hospital and home setup. But um, in terms of the 
number or volume of telehealth services, even though I know it's an important part of the success of a hospital at home, I don't have any insight into that, um, into that particular volume or uh, any sort of quality studies that are related to that. But it is, a, I, again, another important area. There's obviously a lot of new, so <laughs> lots of new things that are coming up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many incredible new areas. I really yeah. want to thank you again for your time today, um, Dr. Ilimudo, and, and all of your expertise you've shared with us and your willingness to answer any additional questions that might arise from participants. I wanted to share with everyone that we will be sending out a recording um, and a PowerPoint um, for participants, and they will be able to be found on our website as well. So I want to thank everyone again for attending. And again, thank you for your time and expertise. Have Thank a great you. day, everyone.